Hello my friends, today we're looking at recapping vintage single-sided 400 kilobyte Apple floppy disk drives that shipped with the original Macintosh 128K in January 1984. The same drive mechanism, which you can see here on this anti-static mat, is also contained in the external drive enclosure. This was released 60 days later in 1984. Uh, this computer sold for $24.95 US dollars. This floppy drive external sold for almost 500 US dollars. <laughs> And uh, you might say, wow, that's pretty expensive. Well, back in the day, they didn't have hard disks in 1984 for the Macintosh, and your floppy drives were all you had. And believe me, when you had the 128K, you really needed an external disk, otherwise it would be disk swapping hell. And I lived through that. I was 13 in 1984, and I, unfortunately, when my father brought the computer home, it didn't have the external. So these were very, very important and useful back in the day. Uh, the actual hard disks didn't really start coming out until 1985. And even then, Apple's Hard Disk 20 only stored 20 megabytes and it was serial, meaning there is no SCSI on these original 128K and 512K Macs. So it had to connect through the floppy disk connector on the back. So basically you got the same speeds as you would get with your floppy. <laughs> you just got more space. And space is really the key to these three and a half inch disks. Back in the day, the mainstream disks were five and a quarter inch size. They only stole, uh, stored 360 kilobytes. And even some competitors who had three and a half inch drives, um, they did not have 400 kilobyte storage. Most of them had 360 kilobytes and Apple was able to achieve it by varying the rotational speed of the disk. Now, the reason we're even talking about this today is because as I've mentioned many, many times in my other videos, no electrolytic fluid filled capacitor has eternal life. And there are a number of fluid filled capacitors in these drives, just like there is in the computer. And it's really quite strange to me why no one has yet, at least until my video today, come out with a video on this subject. I think it's because, well, just most people overlook it. Uh, myself included, some of the first things we want to do are uh, recap the internals to the Mac to make sure the Mac's up and running. And we don't really notice so much uh, what's going on with a floppy disk drive. Uh, some of you have modern replacements like the floppy EMU, so you may not even re rely on these drives anymore. And perhaps maybe some of you have an, a newer Mac that you use an 800K floppy drive instead. But for those of you who like to keep your machine stock, and who actually don't just put it on a shelf, but would actually want to use it as well. Uh, recapping these drives, I think is very important because there's nothing magical about these capacitors that make them last forever. They need to be replaced as well. In the text description below this video, if you're watching it on YouTube, you click show more, click the little down arrow, you'll find all you need to know, including my lubrication video, which is the first thing you should do uh, to get your drive up and running if it has frozen grease but I would also advise you to follow this video as it will show you how to replace all of the capacitors. And in the text description below, I have, like with all my other recapping videos, put a Mauser cart for you to make it more convenient. So let's get started. Now, if you have one of the external 400K drives like this, I would highly rec recommend working on either a wooden desk or if you don't have one of those, then do what you see here. Get a rubbery anti-static mat. I have a link for you below in the text description where you can buy it cheaply off Amazon. That's where I bought mine. And it provides a soft surface and anti-static provided that you connect the alligator clip lead to an earth ground, which you can do if you have a pipe in your home or if you have a three prong outlet, you can take the ground prong and uh, with an adapter you can connect to that, but make absolutely sure you ground this so it's a grounded mat. This is very important for these older 1980 electronics, which are not quite as durable in terms of static discharge as more modern electronics are. And even though you're going to be working on a grounded surface, you still want to be able to ground yourself. So that's why I highly recommend that you also uh, acquire a anti-static wrist strap and this wrist strap is corded. Do not buy the non-corded versions. And you also need to connect uh, the alligator clip here uh, to the same earth ground. On the bottom of the drive, we can see here we have six Phillips head plus screws to remove. Now you just lift up on the back 
and you want to slide it out to the back. With this connector in the back, you just pull it straight up, comes right out of the little hole that it's in. And then you can lift up and pull out. There are now four screws, two on this side and two on this side we need to remove, this time with a flathead screwdriver. You can now carefully slide out the drive mechanism. So, now need to remove the little ground here, just wiggle him. Don't yank on the wire, wiggle on this blue part. And then we can remove this connector. It's best to discharge the CRT simply using an alligator clip wire and a flathead screwdriver. One alligator clip needs to go onto the lug nut. And then we slip our screwdriver under the suction cup. Just make sure that you have your screwdriver insulated so that uh, only the metal is exposed. Fit the screwdriver in until we hear a pop, and it may not pop in your case. And we can actually remove the connector here. It did not pop in my case because this has already bled off the residual high voltage. By the way, you definitely want to make sure that your machine has its power cord disconnected when you discharge the CRT like this. We can now safely remove the motherboard. There's just a little uh, metal shield on here that can come right off. And then there's these two cables. This is just a floppy drive ribbon cable, very carefully rotated and pull it out. And then we have the power cable here. Again, you want to just rock it uh, back and forth very carefully until it comes out. And now it is a matter of sliding our motherboard up. Note that there's two hooks here. And we're going to You can see the rails on both sides. Carefully pick it up and out. And we have four screws to remove with a Phillips head plus screwdriver. Now the screws are removed, and it's just a matter of pulling it right out. We now need to remove the mechanism by removing yet another four Phillips head screwdriver screws. Let me slightly loosen that one. Slides out. At the back of the drive near the ribbon cable, there is a flathead screw that needs to be removed so that we can remove this shield.
And just noting that when we remove this shield, this little piece that sticks out needs to come back inside this groove. And up here, there's a little piece that sticks out that goes under this little hook. Before we get to recapping, I just want to give you an overview of the three 400 kilobyte drive mechanisms that I own, which are shown here on this anti-static mat. Again, I would highly recommend that you use an anti-static surface. Do not put these drives on cloth. The circuit board is on the bottom. You might introduce static to the boards. And in these early 1980 electronics, it could zap something. And you don't want to accidentally kill your drives uh, before you even get to recapping them. So in addition to the uh, anti-static mat, I would also recommend an anti-static wrist strap as well as you extract the boards and begin to work on them. Anyway, what we can see here are different revisions of these 400K drive mechanisms. And on the side label, we see that this one is the 0A-D34V-22. This is the newest revision 400 kilobyte uh, drive. And then on this label here on the front one, we have OA-D34V. So the same model number as this one, except this one has a dash 22 at the end. This one has nothing at the end. From what I understand, there is uh, also another version that's a little bit older than this, but newer than this, which says the same 0A-D34V-02. So it's not a 22, it's a 2 or a 02. And then we have this drive, which came out of an external drive mechanism, which has no label. And I've seen photos on the internet showing other external drives that have no label on the side here. So I, I, I'm going to assume it must have been common. Um, so I cannot say precisely which model this is. However, I can say that I have one of my Macs is a 512K, it has 64K ROMs, but the ROMs are an earlier version of the ROMs. Now, if you have ROMs on your Macintosh 128K or Macintosh 512K, which are the original 64K ROMs, if you look at the part number on them, if there is no letter at the end, or if there is the letter A at the end, it means you have the earliest versions of the ROMs. And in that case, these uh, Dash 22 drives with a Dash 22 at the end are not compatible you will get what's called a Foo64 error, a 0F0064 SADMAC error that only occurs when you connect this particular newer series drive to your older series ROMs, and there's no way to rectify that unless you update your ROMs to either the new B-type ROMs, which have the letter B at the end, or get a Mac set of Mac Plus ROMs, the 128 kilobyte ROMs, and, and only then can you use this drive. For these older drives, which have no numbers at the end, um, and this one, which I cannot say, but uh, I'm assuming it is the same as this one, um, these work with the older ROMs, and there is no error whatsoever there. Uh, however, it is interesting, if we look at the side, you can see that the side of this one is different in, in terms of its shape. You see you've got some plastic pieces here that you don't have on this one. But it's also interesting to note that this one is the same. It looks pretty much the same in terms of its motor. You can see this, this little metal piece here, metal piece here, and yet this is round. It's different. So even though this drive physically looks like this one, this one works for the older ROMs, but this one doesn't. Again, I wish we had a label so I could better understand what's going on. But after examining the circuit boards, it seems like the upper circuit board on this drive is different from the upper circuit board on this one. In other words, this one more closely matches the circuit board in here. So despite the motor difference between this and this, the similar circuit boards between these two the controller boards, I should say, are, are allowing it to work with the older ROMs. I'd also like to point out that this little tab here exists on this drive and on this one, but not on this one. And this tab allows you to use this as an external floppy drive. And the reason why is because you have this grounding tab on the cable 
that comes with the external drive and that fits just right on that tab. But in your case, uh, if, if you're using your drive as an internal drive, it's not going to get in the way. You don't have to worry about it. And I would advise you not remove it because you might lose it. And if you need to put your drive in an external enclosure someday, you will really need to have this to uh, ground the shield on your cable. This is certain to upset the purists out there, but I would recommend taking a permanent marker and writing something like this on the Dash 2.2 drives that you're not currently using if you have them in storage, just to note that they will only work with either the ROM 64K ROMs that have a B at the end or the 128K ROMs. And just to help you avoid confusion, on the left is a 400 kilobyte floppy drive, and on the right is an 800 kilobyte floppy drive. And you'll notice how much taller the 400K is. The height, this is actually in its frame here, but the height of the 800K drive is about the height of the top part of this if you exclude the bottom metal frame. Regardless of which drive version you have, disassembly is all the same. And that remains true even though you can see uh, this circuit board is different from these other two. All of them have three screws that you need to remove in order to remove that bottom logic board and you will need a flathead screwdriver to accomplish that. Now you won't harm your circuit boards or the floppy drive if you have a magnetic tip screwdriver. In fact, it'll maybe make your job easier to get the screws out once you've unscrewed them. But keep in mind, you, you might have a floppy disk lying around somewhere and you don't want to lay your magnetic tip screwdriver or anything magnetic on top of your floppies because that would potentially erase or corrupt the data on them. And now that the uh, bottom circuit board is unscrewed, you want to remove very carefully this connector from the board. If you pull on the wires, I'm, I'm kind of concerned that you might pull the wires out. So there's a little, there's a little, um, uh, protrusion on the connector that will allow you to wiggle it out or you can take your screwdriver to assist you in that. And you won't be able to pull the board just right off because there are connectors on the other side. There's a connector here, and it's got a lock up here. We now have one, two, three connectors to disconnect from here. to successfully removed. And comparing the circuit board, this is the no-label drive and this is the Dash 2.2 newest version drive. You can see that the boards are almost exactly identical. This just has some discoloration here. I'm not sure what happened there. It's a working board so it's not a problem. Uh, all the capacitors are in the same locations and the same values despite the color difference. Uh, and really the only thing noticeable is just the 78L05 um, 5 volt regulator here. It's just a different body shape between the two. But uh, other than that, you can see the same markings on the main IC. Uh, this says 405 and this says 404. But the layout of the board is pretty much the same. All you're really concerned about for recapping though are the capacitors I've already mentioned. The next step is the same again for all of the drives. You have four screws this time that you need to remove also with your flathead screwdriver. Now don't confuse the screws. The screw on the left is the first set of screws, the three screws that we took off at the beginning, and the one on the right is the set of four screws. 
Now take care when, when you flip it over because the top and bottom part are now separated. So what you want to do at this point is pull the front part up. You'll need to put your little plastic head pressure pad down below it. And you can sit it back like so. Um, there's no need to remove it because we're not going to do a full disassembly. We're only going to take off the circuit board. And removing the circuit board also requires your flathead screwdriver to remove a screw here and here, which is true on the other drives as well. You will also need to remove this little tab here to get the circuit board out, which is also true for all of the versions. And the last thing we need to remove to get the circuit board out are these two spring-loaded plastic pieces, which are exactly the same on all the drives. We can start with this side. There is a little half circle here that's uh, stuck to this pin and if you take a very tiny metal tool I prefer a little tiny flathead screwdriver to do it although a sharp metal instrument would also work uh, you're going to stick it in and you don't want to you don't want to bend it but usually you can just pry it and put your fingers around it because you don't want it to pop off and it comes right off. And when you remove the little plastic piece in the spring be very careful because this spring will just pop away from you and if you're not careful and you've got a bunch of garbage or little pieces of gook all around you might lose it. These are springy springs let me tell you so uh, just uh, you know don't squeeze him and let go because he'll fly away. Be very careful to store this away. And the other side is exactly the same. Removing the circuit board is not so difficult now, but you need to keep in mind that these pieces of copper here on the front, they are secured with a white heat sink compound and they might be a little bit stuck. Also, there's a cylinder that goes straight down through, so you cannot pull it off at an angle. You need to wiggle him and pull him up straight up as best you can. Just a little at a time. Wiggle him, and you'll see him slowly come up. Don't force it because uh, if he's stuck, you don't want to crack your circuit board. You need to pull him straight up in order to get it out. And once you've got it popped out, if you feel something pulling it down, it is most likely the connectors underneath. So you need to lift up and make sure you get the wire out. It's the wire that comes through this hole here. Comparing the oldest January 1984 drive circuit board with the no-label drive that came out of the external enclosure, we see that the circuit boards really are identical. The main difference being this copper uh, heat transfer piece overlaps the IC here, whereas on this one, it only comes off these few pins. Also on this one, it's connected to the same pins, but it would seem in this later revision that they thought the, I guess, additional surface area was necessary. But all of the capacitors are in the same locations, and I have verified that they are the exact same values. So even though this no-label drive is clearly newer in every other way except for this PCB, it would seem that the fact that it has this particular circuit board in it allows it to work with the older version 64K ROMs. 
Comparing the January 1984 circuit board with the Dash 2.2 newest version circuit board, we can see some noticeable differences. First is this bothersome connector, which you're going to have to desolder in order to access the three capacitors beneath it. But more than that, we can see that here's one, two, three, four capacitors, and here there's only one, two, three. We see a set the same capacitor here as here, and then we see these two capacitors here and here, but there's a third one here that's not on here. And of course this one microfarad capacitor is the same, 50 volt one microfarad is there. So uh, I have in the text description below separated two different Mauser carts for you. And again, you're going to need to verify by tearing down your drive which version you have before you choose and can choose the appropriate Mauser cart. So I just wanted to show you my workbench area and all the things I have before I jump into the soldering. Uh, you can see that my desk here is made of wood and if you have something like this it's better than the anti-static mat because not only is this anti-static but you don't care if you get solder spilled on it and you don't care if you get burn marks on it, right? It's just your, your workbench basically. Whereas your anti-static pad, you really don't want to punch holes through it, you know, and, and, and let your hot solder get onto it and have burn marks on your anti-static pad. That's, I mean, to me, that's not a good idea. So that's why I say having some kind of wooden surface, you don't want to do it on top of metal. Um, but yeah, it's anti-static and you don't mind if solder spills on it. I'm going to start here with the main board. This is from the older 9th January 1984 floppy drive. Um, you can see my anti-static wrist strap, which again, especially if you have a rug, I mean, you really shouldn't be so hard, uh, dealing with this type of stuff if you got a rug because there's more chance of VSD transfer. I have a hardwood floor under me. But uh, if you're grounded and you work on a non-static, uh, anti, you know, non-conductive surface like this, then you'll be okay. I have two different kinds of solder here, but you only need one really. Um, 1.6 millimeter has a lot more flux in it, and I, I normally don't add flux because through hole work like this, it's different from surface mount, SMD. With surface mount, you might want to add flux. It's really tiny, and um, but I don't do a lot of that work, and so the through hole type, the flux that's inside the solder is usually good enough. You can see my HACO 937 uh, temperature controlled soldering station here in the text description below this video. I have a very similar looking product. I do not link this particular version because it's made in Japan. It'd be very expensive to get to you. Most of you are in the US or other countries, but the one I linked for you is pretty much the same functionality, ESD safe. You can adjust the temperature, but honestly, you want to keep it at 350 degrees Celsius. This is not Fahrenheit, this is Celsius 350 is what you should have it on. Any hotter than that, and you're gonna have a problem. This one only goes up to 350 anyway. And your, if you have a, a sponge, then you can put water on it, you know, and that'll help you clean off your soldering iron as you're using it. I also have one of these. These are sometimes more convenient from the sponge. It's a Hackle brand also, but I'm, again, I'm in Japan, so they're not so expensive. Um, any generic kind will do if you don't like the sponge. Also, I have a Gut Wick. Gut is just a Japanese brand, has Japanese name, you know, written on it. But any kind of copper solder braid for desoldering uh, is all you need. And again, this stuff is linked for you in the text description below. And then I have the two types of capacitors that we're going to need for this particular board, uh, which I bought from Mauser. And again, there's the Mauser cart in the text description below, so you can get these: 47 microfarad, 16 volts, and then. Uh, 22 microfarad, 16 volts. On the big circuit board, we have five electrolytic capacitors to swap out, uh, starting with C116, C113, C103. All three of these are 47 microfarad, 16 volts, and then we have C108 and C115, and both of these are 22 microfarad, 16 volts. And on the older January 1984 board, we also have the same exact capacitors, 47 microfarads. Uh, the silkscreen markings are a little bit different. We have C120, we have C119, we have C103, and then the two 22 microfarad capacitors, C108 and C115. The first capacitor we'll start with is located here, this pad and this pad. 
Um, note that on this early board, they unfortunately hand soldered on an additional ceramic capacitor here. So you will, in the process of desoldering the electrolytic, have to desolder, desolder this foot, which is not a problem. Uh, and then you'll have to be sure to uh, solder it back on when you put in the new capacitor. So what I do is I put um, a little bit of fresh solder on to begin and the fresh solder has flux in it so it helps it helps you to take your desoldering wick and be more effective with it after you remove the capacitor you might say oh my goodness which is the negative side you might have forgotten but it's not something you need to really worry about because there's this white dot here and the white dot shows you the negative side which on this capacitor is the black stripe so on your replacement capacitor your stripe color is obviously going to be something different in my case it's white and you want to have that negative side towards the dot or when you put the new one in Now you might want to press down on him and then spread the legs like that so that way you don't have to press down on him anymore when you solder him back in and you can see that the leg of this ceramic capacitor is still touching this leg so when you put on your clump of solder it will be able to solder them both. Then you want to snip off the legs, the remaining part of it anyway. And make sure that the part you snip off does not stay on the board. And there he is. Now I want to show you the same capacitor on the newer revision board. And as you can see, there's no ceramic capacitor here. Again, they eliminated that uh, with the new revision so it's much easier to desolder we don't have to worry about that anymore and another benefit to these uh, newer revision, revision boards the text is upside down here but it says C116 so it will mark give you the silk screen marking uh, on both top and bottom uh, which is very nice on the bottom because the bottom side is where you're going to desolder so just as I did with the other capacitor we want to add a little bit of uh, flux here to make the place uh, easier to desolder and there we go just like the other board we can see that the dot is marking the side where your negative goes and these newer revision boards makes it even nicer because it gives you the actual schematic symbol so the curved side of the uh, capacitor symbol means negative so you want to put your negative a foot in here for the replacement capacitor and the positive goes in here and if you notice any leaked electrolyte uh, you should just put some alcohol on a swab and swab it away And again, as I'm applying pressure in the upward direction from the bottom to keep his base in place, you should spread out the legs. And here are the two types of boards fully recapped.
Now on the older January 1984 small circuit board, you can see the quantity of electrolytic capacitors is the same. There are eight pieces. However, there are some notable differences. There is no capacitor over here, right? And you have your one microfarad capacitor here, same as the other version. You have your 0.47 microfarad on the very end and 0.22 microfarad capacitor here. So these values are on the other board, although this location for this one is new. And the rest, the, the clump of these three here, this one, and this one, these five, three plus two is five, these five are all 10 microfarads, 16 volt. And the reason they're 16 volt is because space is very limited. Now you might be able to fit a 35 volt capacitor in here. And you can see I've done that. I've just swapped it with a 35 volt because it's fatter. There's enough space for one here, but there's no space for anything wider than the 16 volts in these two places. You might fit a 35 volt a little bit wider one here, but definitely no space here. So when you buy your capacitors, if you have an older board like this, obviously before you buy your capacitors, you need to check, but you need to make absolutely sure that you get 16 volt, 10 microfarads for these three, this one, and this one. So five pieces. Uh, this board is nice because this connector, the wires, do not cover up these capacitors. I'm only going to desolder one of the capacitors for you, just because the procedure of desoldering is the same for all of them. As you can see, these capacitors are not marked on the bottom, so you need to be careful which pads you desolder. Trying fresh solder to make them easier to desolder. Same dot is appearing here as well on C13, so we know that's where we put our striped negative side. On the newer revision dash 22 circuit board, we have the same eight capacitors. Note that these three are C13, 14, and 15, and the only way to access those is to desolder this connector, lift it up, and then you can more easily desolder those. We note that we have C16 here, C2 here, C7, C8, and C11 here. And here is the newer version motor board after recap. I should mention that the feet are very they're only a couple millimeters apart and you might have difficulty seeing them so uh, don't be ashamed to use your magnifying glass if you have one because this certainly can be of help to you i would recommend you clean off the thermal paste using alcohol and a swab this is very old thermal paste even though it hasn't really hardened up much you should replace it and as with all thermal pastes only use thermal paste that's fairly new. In other words, usually a year old or less. And that way it will do its job better. For these old boards, it really doesn't matter if you use good stuff or just, just as long as it's fairly new thermal paste. And of course, clean off the uh, other side as well on the uh, actual frame of the body. Now, I cleaned off all of the uh, stock thermal grease from here and also from the frame and again you can just use whatever you have so long as it's not too old I have some um, fairly new Arctic Silver 5 that just happened to be on hand right now and so what I can do is just uh, apply a dab and it, it will spread out
this isn't a CPU, so people who are watching this can't say, hey, that's too much. This is a 400K, <laughs> 400K drive from 1984. And again, it'll rub on here and be fine. Now, before you assemble everything, I would strongly suggest that you do some head cleaning. That's what I'm gonna do right here. I have a swab that has some alcohol on it. And you don't wanna rub it on this felt pad here. I'm just rubbing it on the head, which is on the bottom side. Just very carefully. And uh, get all the gunk off that. You might want to take a magnifying glass to make sure there's no little hairs left over once you're finished. And then of course let it dry. Alcohol dries pretty fast anyway before you put down the pad. I'd also like to say that uh, if you are in need of grease on this little thing here, you probably aren't, but if it looks dry uh, you can apply some new grease to that. I have recommended silicone grease However, you don't really want to mix greases. It's probably best if you're going to put silicone grease on to get rid of the old. I'm sure, quite sure it's lithium grease that's on here. But if you have lithium grease, you can put that on here. But on mine, it's, um, it's still nice and soft, so I'm going to leave it the way it is here. So when reassembling the drive, um, once you have your grease, thermal grease applied, just make sure you have your connector in first. Definitely don't forget to put these on first before you screw down everything, otherwise you'll have to take it off again. You're gonna need some kind of metal tool, otherwise you cut into your finger Basically, you apply pressure. The only danger is you don't want to bend him by accident. So you want to have him, you want to be able to push from behind. Maybe a bigger screwdriver. And of course, make sure your little plastic pressure pad spring-loaded part here, the arm, is above the metal. And then you can flip him over.
And putting the circuit board back on, it's your choice, but I would strongly suggest you put one of these three connectors in first. Probably this one would be best to go in. And you, you can pull out these wires. You just need to stuff them back in there again. It's actually easier to reconnect than it was to disconnect them. And you're going to have this metal piece coming through the hole here. If you feel a little bit of pressure, then that's okay, but probably the pressure is coming from the wires not being pushed down enough on this side. If you feel a lot of pressure, then you need to fix the wires underneath. Now before you do anything else, just try it a disc. Do it a few times. Make sure everything's smooth. This doesn't have any grease on it at all, so uh, if yours needs grease or if you haven't already done it already, now is the time to do the lubrication. It's now time for what we call the smoke test, where you actually flip on the power and see if there's any smoke that comes out. In all seriousness though, you do need to recheck your capacitors. I would suggest three times for each capacitor to make absolutely sure you did not connect any of them backwards. If you did, when you flip on power, you're going to hear a firecracker-like pop, and any capacitors you put in the wrong way will explode. They most likely will not cause damage to your circuit board, but if you didn't buy any extras, well, you'll be out of luck. You'll need to replace those capacitors. So there is another way you can test without reassembling everything like you see here, and that is in the opening footage at the very beginning of this video, you saw that I had one of the floppy drives connected through an external drive cable to the back of the Mac, and that's one way to do it, assuming you have an external floppy drive enclosure that has that cable. But for the vast majority of you, I would say that if your floppy drive by and large worked before, if you relubricated and recapped it, and if you recapped it correctly, <laughs> And you're probably not going to have a problem and you're not going to be wasting your time by reassembling everything like you see here. I think it's the absolute safest way to test everything so you don't accidentally short circuit or mess up anything. So really the first step is just to switch on power which is what I'll do now. No bad sounds? So uh, 
How do we know if everything appears to be okay? You simply look inside the floppy drive slot with a power on to see if there's a red LED. If the LED is lit, it has power. The next step is to boot from an actual floppy. Here we go. And this is showing that the drive is working perfectly. If there was still a problem with the drive, it would not have booted to the desktop. By the way, if you're looking at this and saying, hey, those icons look funny, the reason why is because this is system 0.85 pre-release. It's the same system used on the mousing around disk that shows you how to use the mouse with the original Macintosh 128K. The release version has different looking icons. Let's go ahead and eject this disk and to do that we will go up to the file menu and eject. And that shows that our ejecting is working very fluidly and smooth. That's an important test to do. You'll note on this early version there's no shutdown command so you simply eject the disk and turn off the power. But you might say, well, what happens if you leave the disk in and you actually turn off the computer with the disk in? You don't want to boot from the same disk again, perhaps. And we'll do that now. Power is off. In order to remove the disk, you could put a paper clip in this hole, but a much easier method is to take the mouse and hold the mouse button down as you turn on power. And there it goes. So that's how you eject a disk. Okay, so now I will connect the external floppy drive and give that a test. Okay, the external floppy drive is connected. By the way, I connected it with the power off. You never want to connect or disconnect the external floppy drive, or even the keyboard for that matter, or the mouse, or really anything on these classic Macs when the Mac's power is on. It's not like USB. So you've got to get out of that USB thinking mode where you can plug it in with the power on. In these old days of these Macs in the 1980s, you could not do that. So it's all connected. I verified that the red light, the LED light, is on inside this external drive. So we're going to boot this time from this external floppy drive using a different OS. And it too is booting fine. It has the hard disk 20 startup, uh, although I don't have my hard disk 20 connected at this time. And there we go, it booted straight to the desktop. So now let's put a floppy disk also in the internal drive. And it is asking to repair this disk because again, 0 0.85 is an older version that the newer version doesn't understand. So I'll just go ahead and okay that. And actually, it's reading from both floppy drives, doing whatever it needs to do. And there we go. We have both floppy drives mounted on the desktop. So currently, we have the 0 0.85 uh, floppy disk. We can hit Command-O and open that up to see what the contents are. And you can see that even though it's 0 0.85, we're not booted into 0 0.85, so the icons look normal in this case. We can go ahead and uh, hit Command E, which ejects that disk. And then we should try ejecting the external. And there we go, it ejected uh, just fine. Now you might say, what happens if we put the disk back in the external? And then we shut down power. 
In this case, the external floppy drive does not behave exactly the same as the internal drive. If we press and hold the mouse button, for example, and then switch on power, it tried to eject only the internal disk. Notice I'm still holding down the mouse button, and yet it is booting off the external drive. So what that means is if you have your disk that is inside the external drive, assuming your disk is lubricated well and ejecting properly, you'll just simply need to boot to the desktop and then use the software to eject it. Or if the computer is off, you can use a paper clip. If any of you know a trick to like the mouse button being held down and boot to get it to automatically pop out, then please let me know. There might have been one back in the day, but I'm just, I just don't remember if there was a way to do it. So I've just told you the only two ways that I would know. So again, you would go up here, or you could do Command E. It ejects the disk, and then you can shut down your computer this way, which of course, for these old Macs, it doesn't actually shut it down, it just restarts it. There are little beeping sounds, very faint. You can almost not hear them at all. Whenever the floppy system is being accessed, whether it be the floppy EMU, which is all digital, or the mechanical floppy drive. And there you have it, folks. I hope this video was helpful in uh, helping you to understand how to disassemble, to recap, and then to reassemble the 400K internal and external floppy drives that came with the original 128K and 512K Macintosh in 1984. Uh, again, please, I've repeated it over and over, and some of you hate that, but repetition is actually deliberate on my part. Uh, yeah, sometimes I'm forgetful too, but it's actually because we're all forgetful to some extent, I repeat it down below this video in the text description. There's all caps, show more, and on mobile, it's little t -t -t down, down little uh, down arrow mark. You click that and it'll expand out. You'll see a Mauser cart. For those of you who don't know what Mauser is, it's just an online vendor of electronics. And I have a cart filled with all the capacitors you need uh, for either version. And you'll see the two separate links, depending on which version of the drive that you have, down the text description below. I'd also like to mention that if you only buy those capacitors and only one set of them, then you will not qu qualify for free shipping. However, I have other videos with other Mauser carts, and if you add those capacitors, uh, basically combine carts together, you probably will get enough to qualify for sh free shipping, which uh, will ship to pretty much anywhere in the world. So be sure to check that out. I put more than just the Mauser card in the text description, other, other useful and interesting links that you might find helpful. I'd also like, uh, before I close out this video, to say a special word of thanks to James Brown, who made a significant PayPal uh, contribution this month of May 2020. And I'd also like to th have a special word of thanks for uh, Patrick Randall. Thank you both, uh, you two gentlemen. Your contributions uh, will go towards making this channel better. Uh, of course, I extended my thanks to others who have contributed this year. and. I'd also like to thank all of you who have uh, recently subscribed. Uh, we've picked up quite a few subscribers in the past couple months uh, of this year. And if you're not already subscribed and Google Analytics tells me that 97% of you are not, uh, please, if you, if you like the content here, give this uh, channel your vote of confidence by subscribing. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And um, if you have any feedback, uh, please, that's what the comment section is for. I read and reply to every single comment and I have, I'm happy to engage you there and I'm fully aware that recapping isn't going to solve every problem. So if you had a major problem before this, probably it was the grease, the thermal grease, not, not thermal grease, but uh, the lubrication that is frozen up that you need to relubricate that. But even if you, uh, you know, have no problem with your floppy drives, recapping it, I mean, after all of these years, it's something that you need to do. So that's what this video is meant to help out with. And as I close this video, I just want to show you, I guess we could say it's one more test. This is the actual floppy disk for Epic's Winter Games that I purchased back in 1985. And I must say that this game was truly uh, one of my favorite games uh, of the time. 
it's, you know, maybe to some of the younger people today, a little bit boring, maybe not quite so interesting. But um, I, I personally thought it was a, uh, a really amazing piece of software back in the day. And I'll go ahead and boot from that floppy disk now just to, to show it to you. But um, uh, you can download that. I'll put links for you in the text description below so you can uh, check that out and run it on your own machine. But uh, I cannot tell you the number of countless hours <laughs> when I was 14 and played this particular game, uh, which really, at, back in the day, it, it kind of blew me away with all of the graphics and uh, how fun it was, actually, to, to play. Practice more. <laughs> 